So all, all of these talks seem to be running over, so I'm going to make this um, uh, brief. Uh, uh, it is my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Omar Rivera. And uh, I met Omar, I believe, in maybe 1998 or so. And I just wanted to mention three things that uh, have always stood out to me uh, in my interactions with him. The first is his um, focus and clarity and attention to whatever is being said. Um, the second are his, uh, I think, really uh, remarkable skills as a reader. He's really trained in classical philosophy and, and does that work uh, as, as well as anyone I know. But third is that he has this um, tendency and predilection to go somewhere completely different. <laughs> and um, I've always appreciated that. Um, he's teaching at the uh, Southwestern University of Texas in uh, Austin, uh, where he teaches uh, philosophy. But he's also, um, that is to say, classical Western philosophy. Uh, he's also working on indigenous Indian traditions and uh, questions related to aesthetics, politics, and ethics. Uh, thank you for being here, and thank you for inviting me, Alejandro. Um, so this is not a paper anymore because everything that has been discussed has interrupted it violently. So I'm more in a, in a space of dialogue right now than in a space of, uh, you know, uh, trying to profess something of some sort. Um, so I'm very confused about what I'm going to try to tell you, but I'm going to go ahead. And when uh, Sandy was speaking this morning, I, I, I realized that the origin of my thinking uh, happens in, in, in a memory that I have uh, growing up in Lima uh, when uh, the Shining Path was bombing Lima. And, uh, and I was still young, and my, my father would take me to the rooftop of my house. There would be a blackout, and he would uh, we'll play a game of trying to identify what was being blown. And uh, that memory is so disturbing and so confusing, and it, uh, it determines the sensibilities that I think I'm going to try to talk to you about now as a white, male, privileged Peruvian uh, trying to talk about uh, Andean uh, Quechua uh, thought. Um, anyway, so one of the things about the memory, too, is that the, the Shining Path uh, borrows its name from Jose Carlos Mariati, uh, and the Shining Path is supposedly an indigenous revolutionary movement, even though Jose Carlos Mariati is not indigenous, uh, him being more, uh, I guess, mestizo. And, and then I am reading Jose Carlos Mariati as well. So there's a kind of very complex set of lineages there and confusion of, of lineages and influences that, that I cannot explain, but I think are thought provo provoking. But let me begin. Uh, I, I begin with uh, uh, this word. Uh, is a term that Joseph Esterman uh, uses in his book, Philosophia Andina, Ruana, to, 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 to keep the Quechua sense of uh, what needs to be done. Right, what needs to be done or what ought to be done. And then he uses this term, Ruana Sofia, as a kind of wisdom about what ought to be done. You know, it's, a, it's another way of talking about et ethics. And he includes the word Sofia to always remind us that he is not an, uh, an Andean uh, indigenous thinker, right? So already the, the project is kind of compromised from, from the get-go. And then uh, I also use the word Runa to talk about indigenous, indigenous peoples because that word runa is what they call themselves and uh, to, to respect some kind of uh, singularity there. Anyway, um, my title signals the retrieval of an ethics of the runa or a ruana sophia in order to understand um, runa forms of revolutionary praxis. So the key here, right, is to signal for me, the urgency of this retrieval, right? The need to think these revolutionary forms of praxis from an runa lineage, from a runa perspective, right? Instead of, instead of resorting to somewhere else. So what does Ruana Sofia tells us in some sense about uh, uh, revolutionary praxis? 
But the key also here is that I am not going to, to give you an account of Ruana Sofia and tell you this is, this is what we should be looking at and so forth. What, what I'm really interested in is why this project is urgent, like why we need to do this. Why do we need to turn to Ruana Sofia? And the way I'm going to do it is to show how this urgency of this retrieval, the need for this retrieval, happens in the work of Jose Carlos Mariati in, in Peru in the 1920s. Um, and the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to show you tensions, fractures, contradictions in Mariati's position that open up tensions that need to be thought or at least point to or signal the need to be engage a kind of Ruana Sofia. So I'm not, I'm not telling you this is what Mariati says. I'm telling you this is where Mariati begins to crack. Right? Those are tensions here, and then we, we need to uh, engage this um, Ruana Sofia. Anyway, Mariati's attention to R Runa heritage and the study of the political and economic history of Peru led him to identify the Runa not only as a group that ought to be integrated politically, economically, and culturally through a socialist, socialist revolution in the forging of a new Peruvian nation, but also as the group whose historical task is to carry out the socialist revolution that would constitute the second, and this time, genuine emancipation of Peru, undoing not only the dynamics of oppression implicit in capitalism, but also those of continuing colonial practices. He states, for example, that his revolutionary generation recognizes that the progress of Peru will be fictional unless it is the result of the work and specific aspirations of the masses, which are four-fifths indigenous and peasant, as he says. And he adds that such work would be undertaken, quote, by the indigenous peoples themselves, end quote, who, within this revolutionary atmosphere, quote, they are beginning to show a new conscience. So this is a pretty radical statement, right? The socialist revolution is an indigenous revolution carried out by indigenous people that are showing a revolutionary conscience. Um, so what, what I need to emphasize here is that Mariati, him being a mestizo and not an indigenous person, articulates a version of socialist uh, revolution on the basis of indigenous forms of revolutionary practice. Um, and it is not the case that non-indigenous people are to be excluded from the revolutionary effort, right? He's not excluding non-indigenous. And it's not the case that the goal of the revolution is a kind of return to Inca forms of politics, but rather, right, um, the idea is that the socialist revolution has to be informed and elaborated, elaborated from a runa perspective, as I'm calling it, from a runa indigenous perspective. Um, and ultimately, all of Mariate's writings, including his meditations on European politics and art, and those who appear to use only European concepts and sensibilities, have to be understood from this point of view. They are writings that implicitly or explicitly work towards an articulation of an indigenous socialist revolution in Peru. In his own words, and these are again radical, problematic words som sometimes, the redemption of the Indian is the cause and the goal of the renovation of Peru. And another quote, the faith in the indigenous resurgence does not come from the material process of westernizing Quechua land. It is not civilization nor the white man's alphabet that raises the indigenous soul. And then this is fascinating. It is the myth, the idea of the socialist revolution. The indigenous hope is absolutely revolutionary. Quite interesting, right? Because he's using the idea of socialism as somehow not belonging to that white European civilization, but actually it's raising the soul of the indigenous peoples. And that's a tension that I'm trying to work through here in any attempt to, to formulate a, a, a form of, of indigenous resistance from this kind of point of view. Um, anyway, so Mariati's project was truncated by his early death in 1930. And what he's left us is really with a perplexity as to how to do this. So his, his legacy is one of uh, opening up a problem and a set of difficulties rather than telling us systematically how we should go about doing this. And what I'm going to do is, this paper has two parts, I'm going to show in what ways Mariate's own, as I say, truncated effort brings up the, what I call the urgency of engaging what I'm calling Ruana Sofia or an ethics of a Runa. And then the second thing that I'm going to tell you about is how I think that Mariategui himself was already determined by certain 
ruanasophical sensibilities, even though he might not recognize them within himself, and that him as a revolutionary type also is a, is a strange paradigm of conflicted sensibilities that have a, a runa lineage, a lineage in, in indigenous, um, indigenous population. Um, okay, so now I'm going to not read that much, but just go through some movements to provoke some questions, and then I'm going to read the end of the paper. Mariate, <coughs> Mariate is, is works this way. He, he is very concerned, as he thinks Marx was, with the idea of recognizing oppression. Okay, recognizing oppression. The question, of course, is that at the moment that we recognize oppression, we also engage in a representative movement in which the recognition of the oppressed is also a representation, in a way, of who they are. And we can fall into a kind of categorical a categorical definition of the oppressed, right, in, in the very movement of their recognition. So that, that made Mariati really uh, hesitant as to how to do that, even though he understands the necessity to do it. First problem. So the question is, how does he go about and do this? He says, well, the important thing about Marxism is that Marxism uh, is a way of doing this. It's a way of recognizing the oppressed. And he says Marx recognized the proletariat and found in the proletariat some revolutionary potency. The problem is that he cannot translate that into a Peruvian context, right? So he has to remain within a certain ethical concern informed by Marxism, but he cannot elaborate his own thinking in the same ways that Marx elaborates his own thinking. So what does he do? Well, this is what he does. He recognizes, like, like Marx, that capitalism is ethically bankrupt. He recognizes, like Marx, that surplus value is an ethical concern and not a scientific concern, right? So it's an ethical first position, um, particularly to identify structures of oppression. But what he cannot really do is to go ahead and say, well, the definitive mode of oppression that we find in terms of the oppression of the native populations is in terms of their labor. Because labor has a series of metaphysical baggage, right, that we cannot just simply translate from a Marxist place to, to a Runa and Dian place. Now, this is a very, very deep problem. First of all, because what are we going to do that now? But second, it's because he cannot just dismiss the problem of, of labor, because for Marx, the problem of labor was not just a systematic problem. The problem of labor had to do because Marx recognized that work was an affirmation of life, was the affirmation of life, right? So, so people found sources of affirmation in their work. So Mariati doesn't want to let go of that. So what Mariati wants to, to and still kind of following, but not following Marx is saying, well, what is the source of affirmation of life in those op oppressed people, right? How do we understand that source of affirmation in a way that we do not just simply impose structures of what it is to be oppressed? And particularly, we need to, re to be very respectful of letting the oppressed articulate their own oppression from their own lineage, from their own context. So again, Mariate is playing with all kinds of difficulties here. Um, so this is what he, d he, he did. He basically said, Marxism and so, so socialism is a method, it's not, it's not a science, right? It's a method, it's a way of identifying oppression, but it's a method that needs to be text, uh, tested continuously, right, in particular uh, contexts. So uh, there is no doctrinal Marxism here, it's just a method, what I call a methodological open Marxism. And in particular, Marxism has to be operative in a way in which it's tested against the very ways in which those groups that we s are recognizing of oppressed articulate their own oppression for themselves. Does that, does that make sense? I, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, again, it's a very interesting use of, of Marx here. Um, so the weird thing then is that Mariati goes ahead and says, if you really want to understand um, oppression in Peru, you do need to identify 
the native population as the oppressed. And not only that, but you need to identify a particular socioeconomic structure as the cause of their oppression. And that socioeconomic structure was what is called the gamonales, which is uh, basically forced labor run by white people. So how can Mariate both hold to a kind of open, exploratory Marxism and then fall back into a notion of we have to identify this oppression as the fundamental oppression in Peru and as having to do with socioeconomic uh, factors. And what he does, and this is many people don't really understand this, is that his point in identifying the gamonales is not to say this is a social, strictly economic problem, is that he says this is a problem of law. And what happens in the gamonales is that what we're identifying is the way in which Peru renders invisible, renders invisible a particular population. And what, but what that invisibility means is that there is a group of, of, of people in Peru, right, that do not have the right to have rights. Right? They do not have the right to have rights. And that circularity is an abysmal problem. Right, this is the problem of, of, of what happens when, 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 when the law is not, uh, does not protect a group of people. So my claim is that the reason why Mariate is interested in the, in the native population at first is not because he's going to impose ways of understanding their oppression on them, but because they are paradigmatic. They are paradigmatic of the production of invisibilities, right, of invisibilities within a system a system of, um, that presents itself you know, as a modern democracy or so forth. Um, if this is the case though, why does he, if, is, if, if this is the case, why does he then prioritize the runa, the indigenous populations as revolutionary agents? That's another problem, right? What, because as by doing that, now not only identifying them as oppressed, but as revolutionary agents, we are also imposing, we could also be imposing ways of understanding them, ways of understanding them as having a special potency to be revolutionary, right? And why would indigenous peoples have a special potency to be revolutionary? How is not that an extension of colonization? And that is where it gets really tricky because Mariate's solution is actually not theoretical, it's actually practical. His solution is they are already revolt in revolt. The revolution is already happening. So I don't need to create a category of a revolutionary agent in order to engage in socialism, right? So we start from the, from the, the view that we will need to reveal their oppression to the oppressed. We will need to tell them how to be oppressed. They, we will need to raise the awareness of the oppressed into an awareness of their oppression or, or the oppressed into awareness of their oppression. In fact, Mariate is very suspicious of anything like that. And, and, he's, and he, he's very suspicious of thinking that simply bringing someone who is oppressed into an awareness of their oppression, that would translate into some kind of revolutionary action whatsoever. So his, his starting point is practical. If this has been going on, you're right, right since, since the conquest, we don't need to do that work. So what is socialism then? What is socialism if it is not a matter of this raising of awareness, if it is not a matter of this saying, hey, you need to revolt for this and this and this reason. Well, what socialism is, and this is very interesting, he, the way he, he portrays it, he says, what, what socialism is, is to, is to be able to integrate the cause and the, and the needs of the indigenous population into a sense of the nation or a sense of an integrated nation. So what, let me explain to you what this means. What this means is that what socialism allows to do is to, is to translate, in, instead of telling, the, telling a particular group what they should be feeling about their oppression, it's just to allow them to translate their, their own source of interpreting their own situation into a larger context of oppressive practices. Right into a large so so what we need to do is he says in Spanish we have to create un vínculo nacional. Right, the revolution it has been happening at the level of indigenous revolution. Now we need to expand this, Expa and 
right, articulate, translate this into a context of what he calls a more, uh, more integrated Peru. Very interesting view of socialism. I don't know if it's tenable ultimately, but that, that's kind of what he's saying. And then um, the, the, the problem though remains, doesn't, does, doesn't this in fact assume or still give privilege to indigenous people as, as being able to somehow operate in a harmonious way with his own version of socialism, even if it's open and experimental and methodological, doesn't he have a view of indigenous, indigenous peoples as having a sense of op, you know, open revolutionary activ activity, you know, as being able to translate their revolutionary spirit into, into projects that are not necessarily indigenous anymore, into projects of a kind of continual process of revolution. And that is an issue. Why, why do we need to think that indigenous populations have that kind of, of insight, have that kind of lineage and constitution that allows them to do that? He has an intuition, and I think at this point he just relies on intuition, and his intuition is that there's something that, 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 that he feels that is true about this. And now this is a problem that, I, that we'll talk about in a second. Anyway, so, that, so these are the two, the, the two fractures that I want to tell you about right now. Are the fracture, the one, one fracture in Mariate's thought is, can we really um, un understand uh, how indigenous populations enact their own affirmation of life Right, what is, you know, which is Marx's question when he uh, identifies a proletariat. Can we do that with indigenous populations? Can we, can we really engage what it is an indigenous runa way of life affirmation? And the other question is the one that I just talked to you about, is aren't we in fact imposing categories on the runa people, even if they are categories that present them as being, you know, perfectly revolutionary? two fractures. And then uh, the more interesting ones is, are the ones that come later. Um, Mariategui understands himself as being partic as participating in this revolution that he's trying to tell us about. So Mariategui himself is a type of revolutionary. And by that I mean he has certain sensibilities that he acts on the basis of. And my question is, are those sensibilities that he enacts in his identity, are those also um, susceptible to be analyzed and say, well, are your sensibilities just the sensibility of, of a white guy, of a privileged middle, middle class person, or are your revolutionary sensibilities in any way linked, right, to Runa sensibilities, right? Are, are, are there, are there, is there a lineage, right, operative within you already that you might not even know, Maria Tegui, right? Or maybe there's no such thing. Maybe he's coming from, from somewhere else. Maybe he's engaged in a, in a strange extension of, of colonization and exploitation. So, this is where get, things get really messy, okay? <laughs> because Mariategui is a very confused type, and I'll tell you a couple of reasons why. First of all, right, he wants to find an affirmation of life that is immediate, uh, and this is why, because he is really suspicious of any, time, any type of concern for the other to constitute a source of ethical meaning. This is, this is really strange, and the reason is because he thinks that any, any affirmation of life at the ethical level that, that has a concern for the other, right, uh, as its principle, can fall into what he calls a slave morality. Can fall into, into what, it, what he identifies with Nietzsche and so forth, that somehow that concern for the other is a kind of show of weakness. At the same time though, right, he, at the same time, he thinks that the only possible affirmation of life that you could find as a, as a human being is the affirmation of a higher social order, right? It's a higher social order. It's an affirmation that has a, a kind of projective sense. 
So the big question is, how do you do that? How do you affirm a higher social order while not being mediated by a concern for the other? How can you even think that? Mariate doesn't resolve this issue, but I think it's an interesting issue to begin to think about because I think there is some truth to his concern of the way we mediate our own, our own projects of improvement of the world and so forth. We mediate it by engaging the other. And, the re and this goes back to what I was saying before, is because our recognition of oppression is also involves a representation of the oppressed. You see? So, so that's an issue there, right? But the other issue is how to think of a better polit politics, a better political state, if we don't engage the other, right? If we don't engage the concern of the other. He doesn't resolve this. Um, he makes things even more complicated. Because then he engages in, in a kind of double discourse. He's very concerned with what I call passivity and activity. Because he thinks that all kind of affirmation of life right, involves an active, an active moment. So then he begins to lay out the affirmation of a higher or order has to be a moment of action. The affirmation of higher has to be a moment of action. The problem, though, is that when he puts it that way, he talks about the importance of myth. And this is how he understands myth. We need to make sure that our actions reflect a faith, a myth, on the higher order that we're working towards. That means we have to act in a way that we think that our actions have definite meaning and that are going to operate with a sense of finality and bring about a a higher order. Are we on the same, are we on the same page here? So this is just his articulation of myth, his Aurelian, right? And he, f he likes that, he likes that. But at the, same, at the same time, right, he's also suspicious of that. Because he says, if we, if we only believe in that way, if we only believe in that kind of faith, right, in the faith of enacting you know, partic a particular set of actions, right, that are going to bring a kind of liberation to us. He says, we might be precisely missing, right, projects of liberation, you know, that are at stake, you know, for those who are not included in this myth, right, who are not included in this, in this faith. And this is where it gets, it gets really complicated be because then the myth is directed or is, is connected to a notion of activity and this concern for the problematic of the myth, this concern for saying, well, maybe there's a violence there, right? If I think of it in this way, that is connected to a sense of passivity or a sense of abstractness. So Mariategui is caught ethically, right? Between these two notions of activity and passivity, this notion of myth or this notion of recognition of the illusory character of myth. Are, are we on the same page here? Right? And he articulates that in terms of, of activity and weakness. And let me just um, um, read to you. There's one, 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 uh, one quote, but it's a little too long. But he, this is what he says. Um, Progress is fulfilled stage by stage, therefore humanity al always needs to feel itself close to the goal. Humanity always needs to feel itself close to the goal. That's the myth. But then he says, the goal of today will surely not be the goal of tomorrow. But for the human theory in action, activity, it is the final goal. Right? And then he says, the messianic millennium will never arrive. Man arrives in order to depart anew. He cannot, however, do away with a belief that the new journey will be the definitive one. In those words, then you realize the madness in Mariate's sensibility. Right? Because he cannot articulate the notion of faith and myth on the one hand and then keep 
at the same time, the awareness of the illusionary, the elusive character of that myth. I hope, I hope this, I hope, I, yeah, okay, <laughs> okay. So, what to do now? <laughs> Let's see how much time do I have. Okay. This is the other layer of, of difficulty here. Activity is now related to religion and to Christianity, right? So the position of the myth, the position of the affirmation of a higher order via mythical sensibility, via faith, Mariati recognized that as being part of a Christian, a religious and particularly Christian lineage. The passivity though, that's a little trickier. Sometimes he seems to say that you can incorporate this attention to those who are not included in the myth already within the project of the myth. Right? But sometimes he seems to say, no, we cannot do that. This is a fundamental question. Right? To what extent, when we are driven by a myth, be it a socialist myth or whatever, right, can we say, honestly, that we are doing it in an inclusive way? Right? Or is there always going to be a limitation to that inclusion, right? that sensibility? OK. So let me, let me read, read a, li a little few pages for you right now that will make this even more difficult, as you'll see. Mariategui links the ethical commitment to a higher social order to the essence of Christianity and religion as such, which he understands as struggle or agony. Unamuno is his main reference here. He quotes him. We must define Christiani Christianity agonically, polemically, in function of struggle. And then he, he continues. Christianity is not a doctrine. Right? Christianity is not a doctrine. Christianity is the good news. Right? So the agony of Christianity, the struggle of Christianity, is the struggle for a higher order that is the good news, right? And, but those good news, and this is a, the, the interesting part, those good news is always, are, is always presented in the form of fighting, of struggle, right? Of activity. I have to do something, right? A will. But then we find a perplexing statement in the seven essays. And this, this, this is where things get missing. Um, he says, talking now about the religious context of, of, of the colony, he says, the passivity, this is a quote, the passivity with, with which the indigenous peoples allowed themselves to be converted without understanding the catechism spiritually depleted Catholicism in Peru. The missionary's mission was reduced to being a moral guide with no spiritual inquietude. So let me tell you what that sentence, this quotation means. What this quotation means in one register, right, is ca the Catholic missionaries were fighting for a higher order and they were on that path. But the indigenous people because they, don't, they did not offer direct resistance, as he puts it, because they adapted to the Catholic forms, they took away their power. Are, are we on the same page? They, they, they depleted their power, right? And not only that, and at that point, Catholicism becomes dogmatic, becomes moralistic becomes a doctrine. That is to say, it becomes oppressive, which is the other layer of, of problem here. Because basically, you could read this and say, well, the problem of the oppression of the native people is because they depleted his, his Christianity from, their, from its true spirit. So they are, in fact, to blame, <laughs> right? Because if they were not have been as passive, right? If they had given a, a, lo a little more opposition to this, to, to this project of the missionaries, 
somehow, right, the project of the affirmation of a higher order on the part of the missionaries would have been kept alive. That's why this quote is uh, so interesting to me. This is the reason why it's interesting, and then I'm going to go back to the issue of Ruana Sofia, because this is at the core of what I want to say about Ruana Sofia. So what's going on here, right? You can, you can interpret it as I just did, you know, that, that the indigenous peoples depleted the power of, of the missionaries. Or you could interpret it in another sensibility, a different sensibility from this one that is also present in Mariatu, as saying that actually the indigenous peoples were doing something. <laughs> they were not, in fact, just simply passive. That the depletion of the power of the missionaries, the reason why they became dogmatic, is because their contact with the runa, the contact with the runa, involved a, cla a kind of runa Andean indigenous praxis, right? A kind of in Andean indigenous praxis, right? That revealed the dogmatic colonizing character, right? Of the mission. Are, we, are we on the same page about this? So why is this interesting? Because, because if this other view is the case, in which the indigenous are not just passive, but they are engaged in a kind of activity, right? This is a, this is a point in which Mariate cannot just simply go back from. Because at this point, Mariate has to engage the notion, all these notions that he's been working with, the notion of a affirmation of a higher order of life, right? The notion of um, struggle, right, and so forth, he, he has to realize that maybe I need to rethink all of this, right, because in the context of coloniality, that kind of activity, that kind of action for the sake of a higher order may not make sense. It, it, in a way, it's, it might be in conflict, in a, in a strange conflict, with indigenous runa practices. And let me, let me explain to you why. Because according to Mariati, right, and this is, and I, I have some quotes here, but the weird thing ab about, about Mariati in this other lineage, right, in this other sensibility is to say, what is happening is that there's a kind of Andean runa praxis that reveals that that any activity that presents itself as a project to attain a higher order, a higher promised projected order, that any myth, and this is why I don't want to talk about the mythical conscience of Andean people, because myth is, God knows what it is. Any myth, right, any myth has the potency to be violent, right? Any myth has the potency to be violent, has the potency to be Ex exploitative, and what Mariati, I think, realizes, and this is where I think my, this whole thing begin, be, begins to be really interesting, is that it might be that from the Runa perspective, what we get is a kind of perspective about things like messianism, things like religion, things like faith, things like conversion, things like projects of a higher order, right, we might be able to get a perspective in which we are attentive the, of the ways in which op oppressive di dynamics present themselves as liberatory dynamics. Uh, are we on the same page? And I think this is the patience that you were talking about earlier. Are we, are we, th th does that make sense? Yeah. Right, th so the, uh, the, the, na the, the indigenous people have this awareness Right, that any kind of activity, be the activity of oppressor or the activity of those who want to liberate them, are we, are we okay with that? Or the ability of those, right, the, the presence of those who want to, to liberate them, they involve a kind, a kind of structure of power. And that is what's interesting. And I think that perspective, right, and this is my claim, that perspective, that patience, 
that I think you were talking about earlier is what we have access to, right? By encountering indigenous peoples in their own language, in their own tongue. Because I think we be belong to a lineage in which we are not self-critical enough of how much our, well inten our, our good intentions, our bad intention are per permeated by structures of oppression. While there might be another lineage right, in which this becomes apparent, right, which what you is what you were talking about, how the freedom and the oppression are coming together. So what I'm telling you is that maybe there's a lineage, a sensibility in which there's an, an awareness of that, uh, of, of that dynamic. Are we, are we on the same page? And this is why, on top of your reasons that uh, I talked about before, this is why we might need actually to talk about not only Christian, you know, cr Christian ways of, of affirming higher order orders, not only of projects of liberation that have a lineage that, that goes into Europe, but we might have to begin to talk about that history from a Runa perspective. Because there's a sensibility there that I tell you I don't have. I don't know how, how much time do I have? Five minutes. Okay. Five minutes. <laughs> okay. Five minutes because we need, I think we're going to have so many questions that. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. And then at the end of the paper, what I do, there, there are two parts of the end of the paper. Is actually w one part has to do with the ways in which Andean thought has been portrayed by philosophers. And now we enter in, again, that's a, a whole mess. <laughs> <laughs> because these same dynamics are operative there, right? But in the gaze of the philosopher, right? So th there are a couple of things that seem interesting to me. One is that according to some studies that I've done, it might be true that runa modes of thinking are relational oriented rather than entity oriented. And I think this awareness of relationality, this awareness of, of a kind of absolute ground of relationality, that, that is what pacha means as cosmos, allows people right, that exist within that awareness to understand that the, 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 the taking actions as being final and definitive, as if we could isolate them from, from a context and say this action is going to be an action of liberation, that we are going to do it. That a deep awareness of relationality actually allows them to say no, actions themselves are determinate. We don't know, we cannot invest ourselves in the definitive meanings of action and present our actions as if they had definitive meanings. Are, are you on the same page about that? So this relationality, this awareness of relationality occurs as a, as a kind of awareness, right, of the other side, right, of the finality of actions, of saying, yes, you could do this right now, and it might have the meaning that you intended to have, but really, maybe not. <laughs> maybe you might be affecting other kinds of relations over there that you don't even know about, right? And maybe when you are targeting a structure of power over here, that will set up a whole new set of relationalities that is going to be problematic over there. So the myth cannot be a myth, <laughs> right? Oh, that, that final myth. Are, are, are we okay? I, I just want to be clear about this. And again, I'm, I'm saying from the from an outside perspective, uh, uh, not trying to to you know to colonize this this space. Anyway, so how does this? What does it all mean f for Mariate? So I told you, Mariate is confused about activity and passivity, about the myth, right? About the mythical Sorelian affirmation of a higher order, or he's he's also split with within an awareness of of 
of something else, <laughs> right? Of, of the illusory character of this myth. And what I'm trying to tell you is that maybe that awareness for him actually has a lineage that goes back through a long history of indigenous resistance that he himself is not aware of, right? That, but that has allowed him to engage into a kind of hybrid thought, a hybrid thought of revolutionary praxis. And I'm not saying that this is what we should all be doing, but it, we might have to be aware of it. We might have to be aware that movements of revolution, particularly in the Ruin territory, you know, are histories of resistance that include sensibilities and awareness, right? That are, are indigenous. But, and why is this important? I'm not saying that we should stop there, right? But what I'm trying to say is maybe we need to begin to rethink this whole issue of liberation, right? Not, not in the sense right, that we, we need to get rid of it or, or discard it, but in the sense that maybe we have to engage into a recovery, into a recovery of Runa sensibilities to inform the very projects, right, that ostensibly are done in their name. Are we, are we yeah, are, there's much more, but. Really, there is much more. <laughs> yeah, there is much, yeah. Yeah, yeah but. I hope I've been clear. I, I, yeah, okay. okay, we don't have a, a time for an applause. <laughs> we have to go to the questions. <laughs> Enrique. Very well, thank you. Oh, it's thank you. Formula. I would like to do very short four uh, commentaries. Four. Oh, four. Okay. A very, very, okay. very short. Okay. First, when you speak on the law of Peru, in relation with the Gamonales as dominators, mm -hmm. immediately I thought the work of Bartolomé de las Casas, mm -hmm. the Regis Potestate 1514-6. This book for me is more important than the Leviathan of Hobbes. <laughs> and exactly Bartolomé de las Casas criticized the encomienda in Peru that mm -hmm. is the beginning sure. of domination, and he said explicitly, the consensus populi, the consensus of the people, is the foundational moment of the legitimacy mm -hmm. of the king. Mm -hmm. If the king didn't have the consensus of each Indian, not the community, but each personal Indian, the decision of the king is not legitimate. Mm -hmm. It's a fantastic book on relation of Peru and the fun criticize the foundation of the law of Peru. Right. Second, there is a chapter in the socialism, modern socialism of Europe, very important. Is the expulsion of the Jesuits 1767. From this moment begin the idea in Rousseau on all these people, the bon sauvage, and the idea of socialism. Hmm. Babeuf, Morelli, and the people before the utopian socialist read, read many examples of the reductions of the Jesuits. And this reduction of the Jesuits is that you call the Rua communitarian mm -hmm. wisdom that was in the Tupi Guarani, in the Incas, in the uh, Californian people. That is the second suggestion. Mm -hmm. That means if you de made the definition of socialism, this take the own tradition and only expand it, this own socialism is before than the discovery of socialism in Europe. And historically, the discovery of socialism, that is the utopian socialism, Marx, etc., become in Peru and in Tupi Guarani countries. Mm -hmm. Second suggestion. The third, 
when you speak on the myth and the impossibility of the realization, that is exactly the concept of Hinkelamert on the transcendental concepts, or if you want, postulates, other regulative idea. And it's very interesting that how is thinkable, but empirically impossible. Mm -hmm. And that we have a bibliography on these questions. And the fourth suggestion, this subsumption of the Christian messianism in the Rua, Runa wisdom is explicit in Guaman Poma de Ayala. Guaman Poma de Ayala take Jesus, the poor, but interpret this messianic Christianism from the point of view of the Inca wisdom against the Christendom, dogmatic, like you say, modern and colonial. And there is a contradiction there between the, the messianic Christianism that the Indian discover mm -hmm. in their own predi pre predication of the missionaries mm -hmm. and the contradiction with the facts of the Christendom that is the inversion of Christianity mm -hmm. in the idea of Kierkegaard against mm -hmm. Hegel. Some commentaries of very interesting exposition. No, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would suggest uh, um, I have. Um, we have about f five to ten minutes. Uh, we have four questions. I would suggest that we just go through the questions so everybody can hear the question, and then maybe Omar can begin to answer them so we can get the questions in. So please make your questions short, right, so that we can get the questions in, so we can keep talking afterwards, right? I saw Mariate was not as neurotic <laughs> as he appeared to be in the <laughs> presentation, but you raised a lot of really fantastic questions. I was just going to suggest that um, this business of there is no such thing as final struggle, because I have written about this in my book. Um, it was in the context of the Internacional Anthem where La Lucha Final, you know, is sung about. Uh, Mariate comments on this and says, La Lucha Final, there is no final struggle. There's People believe there is a final struggle, but there will be other struggles after, you know, whenever we get, whenever they get to that. So he was just commenting on the lyrics of the international, international hymn, which is the, the hymn that communists sing all around the world. Uh, but what I was going to say is that this, um, um, this um, higher order, you're talking about that presents a dilemma because on the one hand, you know, we, we, um, whatever. Um, I think that the, I think what's going on is that this, you're, you're giving it like a linear reading of the higher order. And I think what, what's going on in Mariategui when he looks at the indigenous myth is a recycling, is the, the meaning of the earth, uh, Pachamama, and so I take this, I take this reading that it's like the Mother Earth. Mm -hmm. And so the higher order might be interpreted in a completely different way. It's not that we're going to keep going towards this higher order and it's going to violate, you know, certain participants on one side or on the other, but rather that it's a process of spiritual renovation. And that that process of spiritual renovation is not on the linear calendar that Western history has, what Marxism has, or um, Christianity has in terms of, you know, this linear idea of salvation history, I'm moving towards an end, some sort of telos or eschaton or whatever, but rather that it's a spiritual order of renovation, okay? And so this higher sense is not something like you were portraying, this higher sense is something that's spiritual rebirth. And it comes through the practice of these indigenous peoples that's, that's the and the paper, link to the earth. That's the part of the paper I didn't, I didn't read. That's, oh. where my, that's where my paper was. Okay. So we should, talk, we should talk more about that. Okay. Because anyway, I, do, it I, do, I do have to think a lot of things to say about so this. The, the, there, so there's two time, time yeah. co there's concepts two of time going yeah. on. There's yeah. a linear concept of time, and there's a, um, a circular, a res uh <laughs> what do you call it, a cyclical, a cyclical. Yeah. Yeah. sense of time and of renewal. 
I also look forward to um, talking to you later, Omar. Thank you so much. Um, you're just an excellent keeper, and I think landing on a lot of things, even though you didn't think you were landing on a lot of things, you really were that I think um, resonate with me. Just first one really quick suggestion, Runa as, you know, or the people, mm -hmm. I think to some degree, um, you know, even that is relational. So to kind of mm -hmm. work in the IU, the huaka, whatever the unit yep. as part of, you know, you hard to have Runa sensibility without those units or Minka, which is the communal work that's getting done. Um, and then also, um, you know, just really appreciating that sense um, that you were, I think, highlighting, which is, um, you know, whether that's notion of patience um, or, or relationality that's also generational and cyclical, mm -hmm. um, you know, as what, you know, I hesitate to call it knowledge, but, um, but that's really where kind of the sensibility sits. Mm -hmm. So, for example, mm -hmm. if if a mountain, you know, I and it always gets brought into the frames of intelligi intelligibility of Western thinking, which is problematic, wasn't worshipped or sacred, but but fundamentally your relation, right? And that's um, a fund of knowledge, just like anything else. It's, you know, primarily, foundationally, whatever, generational. You can't have something there that's instructive that, you know, by its nature is hundreds of whatever of years old. So um, just really, uh, really just appreciative of so much you have to say. Thank you. Uh, Nelson and then Charles. Um, too quickly, so I, I'm not going to be able to make justice to what I'm going to say. So let me throw two, po th two points, uh, questions, concerns. One is, and this is, I, I guess raising this question for all of us to see if it is relevant for all of us to think about. But I've been, uh, now that we have been uh, almost a day and a half, something like that in, in our conversations, been very interesting to, to see this emphasis on, on sensibilities, right? This sensibility of this other subject, oppressed, color, or indigenous, that uh, marvels us, we, don't have so, or you know, we should recognize. Uh, so I am seeing, m I am hearing much more about that sensibility, their sensibility, and less about their activism, right? So I'm, I'm trying to think, what is, what does that mean for us, and what does that mean to raise a question of of the sensibility of that? Oh, of course, there is an importance of that. I'm just trying to figure myself what. What does that mean exactly? Sometimes at some point it comes the, the confessional point, right? That sensibility that I do not have, that I do not know, I need to try to learn. Mm -hmm. um, but um, then I wonder, well, to what extent um, that's still a way, um, I mean, to what extent that declaration of me not having the sensibility is taking place of the very the that the the manifestation of that sense that other sensibility through its very actions, so that instead of letting that speak or try one to engage with that and letting it speak with one in dialogue, mm -hmm. then uh, we is stay in the prelude to that, mm -hmm. where we are more the center, even as we are pointing to that other thing with the, sens the with the sensibility, but at the end, in a way, we are the subjectivity that is more present pointing to that other thing that we don't know. I'm trying to, anyway, the, the concepts are sensibility, vis-a-vis vis vis activism on the one hand, yeah. and of course, we don't want to go to the activism to talk about their activism without being sensible, without knowing that there is a difference that we don't understand, but I see that we're staying a long time on that prelude of the sensibility, and then in this case, what I was wondering uh, is that you're talking about Mariategui and giving this reading of Mariategui's psyche thought, and I was thinking, well, when do we get then, let's say, to, to the same effort engaging, let's say, indigenous activism itself and indigenous intellectual life, where now I Mariategui's dilemmas are less, that they, not that they are not important, but uh, why not also focusing, or may maybe that's something that you do on the paper, you know, on the those indigenous thinkers, activists themselves, mm -hmm. whether they were reading Mariategui or not, 
and engage them and see, put, be, be in dialogue with them. And that will be a way in which I will see more the activism and not only the sensibility. I don't know if this makes sense. Again, I'm making, I, I thinking out loud about this. I understand your question very clearly. So, so yeah. Sithon, if there were time, Omar, I would have asked, I would have observed that one of the core points that you have in your paper is at the end, one of several, and that is the likely or possible requirement on us, or opportunity is a better way to put it, of rethinking our understanding, our concept, our perhaps experiential sense for liberation, mm -hmm. which is a major, major issue that you are raising in the context of a recovery of a mythological sense for, or a sense for the mythological basis for, in this case, the Runa. Uh, so you've got the issue of myth, you've got the issue of Western religiousness, mm -hmm. and you've got the issue of rethinking in this context what liberation can, and I would have asked, ought to mean. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. 